What advice would you give to a young musician considering applying for AYO? Oh, I think really you just have to throw your hat into the ring. Um, you don't really know what you're missing out on uh, until you've actually experienced some of it. Um, and that was certainly the story of my first experience with AYO. I, I did the audition because my violin teacher at the time suggested that it was a great thing. She had been through National Music Camp back in her time um, and said that it would, it would be a worthy experience. And so I, I just auditioned not really knowing what it was, uh, what I was getting myself into. And I was really, really fortunate enough to actually be accepted into National Music Camp that first time. And mm. I got absolutely hooked. But um, really, it comes back to just just apply. Like you, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. And it may just be the best thing that's going to happen to you. So, uh, yeah. Just go for it. Give it a go. Um, any other thoughts, Jackie? Got one more little thing. Um, tick every box you're eligible for because all the programs offer something completely different and and completely exciting and you just literally don't know all the different paths that can open up to you when you're involved in any of the chamber music music camp professional development orchestral programs there are so many programs yeah that's great advice jackie and it is just the one audition for all of those programs so yeah you're right just Tick everything that you are eligible for is, is our advice. Um, what are the audition panel looking for in our auditions? And the assessment is generally around the areas of accuracy, beauty of sound, so tone production, uh, precision in terms of your rhythm and intonation. So good intonation, good tuning, good rhythm, the, the tone or the sound that you make and accuracy. And we appreciate and understand that some of those elements are influenced by the, the recording situation. And uh, I think there is um, some additional information that will be provided about how to make the most of the uh, recorded audition opportunity. But there's also some advice I think that's very, very important uh, about preparation, that is about learning. When you're playing a, a sample of an orchestral piece, understanding the context for that excerpt, so listening to the piece of music, just understanding a bit more about where that comes from in the piece. So some you know, obvious things are to play it, obvious at the right speed or tempo, and to really take notice of what's written on the page in terms of dynamics and articulations. Those kind of things, I think, uh, are really important in a competitive process. And then in the end, really, it's, it's critical that um, one takes this seriously as something that you do have to prepare well for. It is a competitive process that's attractive to a lot of people. And I certainly know from uh, experience that that preparation, that presentation, uh, and that, you know, the, the investment that you make into that process really comes through, no matter whether you're doing it in your garage or your hallway or your bathroom or a recording studio. So those elements of preparation and attention to detail and to really hear what sound you're making and sound is being recorded, all of those, uh, the attention to that will really pay off for you. What has been your favourite memory of an AYO program? Aidan, how about you? There's so many to choose from. That's a really hard question. But, um, oh, yeah, there's just so many that have kind of amassed over the years. Um, like going back to my very first camp, um, the orchestra that I was in was conducted by the, the late Richard Gill, which I feel very, very um, privileged and grateful that I was able to have that opportunity. Um, that's like really what... I guess, kick-started my um, real passion for music or I guess awoke the passion for music. Um, yeah, uh, along the way, there's been the international tour that I've been a part of as well. I mean, fantastic to go over overseas with a bunch of friends from Australia and then experience the, the European um, musical culture, like talk about broadening horizons and... Uh, 
exposing you to the professional music scene, I guess. And then, yeah, even things like um, uh, playing in advanced chamber at National Music Camp, like there's just a whole bunch of new experiences that I managed to keep having on AYO programs and they're all, they're all so fun. So, yeah, I can't give an answer to what my favourite memory is, but there, there are some. Yeah. We'll let you off the hook. That's okay. <laughs> How about you, Jackie? Do you have any highlights? I have two that I can't choose between. Mm -hmm. um, they are the European tour in 2007, playing in those incredible halls, including the Konschertgebau. I mean, what a way to see the Konschertgebau by playing on the stage, um, being involved in that and um, the rest of the tour was just incredible too. And I think the other favourite memory was um, being involved in the Wind Quintet, uh, Young Australian Concert Artists, I believe it was called back then, Yakka. Um, we toured to Cairns and I think what was so special about that program was not just that it was so intense being with just four other musicians and um, working on the wind quintets together, but also the tutors, Peter Luff and Paul Dean from the Southern Cross Soloists. They really opened my eyes to the alternative career paths that you can create for yourself. It's not just about orchestral playing. It's music can take you in so many directions and, and often it's what you make for yourself. Chris, could you explain um, what it means to audition on an auxiliary wind instrument and what um, material do you need to prepare to be considered on one of those instruments? Yep, sure. Thanks, Eliza. So the auxiliary instruments are the uh, piccolo, coronglae, E-flat and bass clarinet and contrabassoon. And if you want to do those instruments uh, as well as uh, flute, clarinet, oboe, bassoon, uh, you'll be given three extra excerpts, orchestral excerpts to prepare. You don't need to do an own choice piece on the extra instruments. So it's just the three excerpts. Um, and uh, I think it's a terrific thing to do to actually to, to do the extra instruments, even though with the clarinet, because we have two of them, we have the E flat and the bass, uh, means your audition uh, recording goes on for quite a long time but it's a really really useful skill to be able to play the other instruments um, that makes you far more employable later on down the track if you can play the you know the piccolo um, or the core anglais to a really high standard they're very specialist instruments um, and it's a really good way of getting a foot in a door um, if you've got skills in those departments just one little thing don't do what I did when I was a student which was pick up a bass clarinet for the first time two days before the audition and squeak and squawk my way through the thing. Um, and the same with an E-flat clarinet, which was horrifically out of tune because I had no idea how to blow one. They are very specialist instruments and you do blow them and, well, the fingering's usually very similar, but you blow them quite differently on all the, all the wind instruments. And so you really need to be having some sort of level of uh, proficiency which comes about from having access to an instrument for you know six months or a year before you want to go out in public and let someone hear it uh, so uh, if you're at uh, a school or university and you have opportunity to borrow those instruments borrow them get you know you can play your Mozart concerto on the on the e-flat clarinet or the bass clarinet or the coronglae it, it doesn't matter it still sounds quite funny but it's a great way of learning to play the thing in tune and to blow it and to work out how to get around it um, and then I encourage you to do the extra, um, uh, the extra excerpts and, and yeah, it, it opens doors. The next question uh, is a good one. It's what makes a strong AYO audition? So I think uh, it would be really helpful to hear from each of you on this to get the perspectives from the different instrumental groups. So um, maybe Molly first, then Chris, then Tim, could you um, talk to us about some of the qualities that you recognize in a strong audition? Well, I think for, for um, uh, there are many qualities that make a strong audition, but I think in particular for string players, um, you need to really aim for good intonation, having a, a solid intonation in your sound, um, strong rhythm, so a good rhythmic pulse, and also um, a nice sound. But also on top of that, it's very important, especially in the, in the um, excerpts, 
to have clear dynamics and articulation, um, plus, you know, whatever musicality and, and phrasing you have to offer. Um, but I think even more important than all those things is the fact that, you know, you want to show the panel that you want to be there and that you want to do a good job. And you need to put in enough preparation and enough time beforehand in order to do that and to put your best foot forward and to show us that, you know, you really want to go for go for it and do the best best job that you can do. But um, yeah, all those aspects are very important for string players and I'm sure for other instruments as well. <laughs> Chris? Uh, yeah, I think um, probably regardless of, of, of the instruments, I think what you're, what you're trying to demonstrate to us and what we're looking for we're on when we're sitting on a panel is, are you the sort of person that I can drop into a wind section or a brass section or a, a symphony orchestra and know that you are going to contribute and it's not going to be a disaster? So that one of the most important things that you must show us is that you have listened to the piece, you know how the piece goes, and you know the function of your part within the greater whole. So the excerpts you're given, some, I mean, a lot of them are solos from, uh, for specific instruments from within the symphonies or the concertos, but often they're not. They're a secondary part or they're a difficult rhythmic part. Um, and it's very important that you can convey to us that you understand how the piece is supposed to fit together because that's what you're going to have to do when you get into the orchestra. The conductor wants you to be able to play your part <clears throat> as mm. a secondary mm. part or a rhythmic supporting part or as a solo. And it's very important that you understand that. Now, that comes from studying the scores, looking, um, uh, listening to lots of different recordings, never always the same recording. Lots, lots of, listen to different versions of the same piece from, from different stages in history. Um, and for me then, the other thing of course is please do the basics. Play what is on the page in front of you. It's incredible how many times you hear something that is the same phrase twice and it goes piano to forte and people will come and play it exactly the same twice. So, so do play what's on, on the page in front of you. Dynamics, articulations, uh, be as rhythmically and as intonation accurate as you possibly can. I think uh, Mo what Molly said about those is it goes for any instrument um, as, as accurate as you possibly can. Um, and the other thing I think probably that I'm looking for is someone who's stylistically aware and correct. So you're not playing a Mozart symphony as though it's a piece of Rachmaninoff and you know, don't pull Mozart around all over the place. Um, if it's Haydn, you're going to play it differently to how you're going to play Stravinsky, that sort of thing. So be aware of where, where the piece comes from, uh, what it was written for, what stylistic period and, and what stylistic characteristics. Play the dots on the page. Um, yeah, and, and show us that you know how this fits in the bigger whole. Tim. Marvellous. I think we're all going to say the similar things, but in different ways or different words. Uh, so there's a whole lot of things that you'll be working on, either with your teacher or, or yourself, to get right, kind of measurable things almost. Are you playing the piece or the excerpts at the right tempo with the right rhythm? Are the notes correct? Are the dynamics vivid and, and right? Is your sound quality good? Is it articulated well? Is it consistent? Is the tuning good? And they're all measurable things that you, I'm sure students work on in detail with their teachers. But then there's these intangible things that just glow to panelists and what they love hearing. A player who plays with conviction and authority, they really, it's like a magnet somehow, but how do you, how do you measure that? Conviction and authority with rhythmic security so you know the beat is strong inside the player. Do they play it with a sense of style and character that just and flair that radiates from the music? Do they do a good job of, of creating a mood or an atmosphere, bringing the music to life? And then the holy grail of auditions is the panel is sitting there hearing one instrument, whether it's a, a triangle or a clarinet or a cello, but somehow they hear in their head the whole orchestra. And if you can play your instrument in a way that so convincing that the panel hears the whole orchestra at the same time, you have got it. And they'll think, that's right. That's what we want. We have had a few questions on AYO's assessment process and fairness come through in the past few weeks. So I will just spend a couple of minutes at, uh, addressing some of those ones now. Um, so the first question is, who assesses my um, audition? Uh, so AYO engage uh, professional orchestral musicians who have experience as auditioners. Um, to do our assessment. This year we have 18 assessors in total, so you can find their names listed on the AYO website. And these individuals each form um, panels of two, so every single audition will be assessed by two people. 
Um, there may occasionally be a case where one of our panellists has a future student relationship uh, with an applicant. And where that's the case, that panellist won't have access to that particular audition video. So no applicant will ever be assessed by their teacher. Um, and there is a specialist for every inch instrument <coughs> on each panel of two as well. So for example, if you're auditioning on the flute, then your audition uh, will be assessed by at least one flautist and the same goes for every single instrument. Um, so another question was, can I have feedback after my audition is assessed? Um, so just due to the high number of applications that AYO receive, we aren't able to provide uh, individual feedback to applicants this year, unfortunately. Um, do existing AYO members get preference over people auditioning for the first time? Uh, so no, they don't get preference. If you win a place on a program, then that's for one year. Uh, and then everyone uh, auditions again annually, including people who have been successful for, you know, three to five years. Um, they still re-audition each year. Um, so the panel will only take into account what you have presented uh, in this audition. Um, so if this is the first year that you are auditioning, then you have just as much chance to get in as everybody else does. Um, and every year we have um, many people joining um, the program for the first time. Um, so just, yeah, the last question I'll answer before we get back to hearing from the experts. Uh, is are you able to provide some rough numbers on how many people apply each year and how many get in? Um, so AYO get around a thousand applications most years. Um, there are roughly 500 places available each year. Sometimes people do more than one program. So a few of those places could go to one individual. Um, and there are roughly 100 to 150 new participants in our programs each year. So whilst the programs are competitive, <coughs> there's, there's quite a bit of opportunity available there. So as I think everyone mentioned, that the National Music Camp is a really intense action-packed experience. Uh, and that's particularly true of the orchestral management program. Uh, those that participate in this program get some rather fast-tracked real, real world experience by taking responsibility for managing all of the orchestras at camp. Uh, they look after their rehearsals and all of the performance activities during the two weeks. Uh, there's opportunities during the program to try on lots of different hats uh, from being a stage manager, an orchestral manager, a librarian, to being an artist liaison. Uh, the orchestral management participants are usually the first to arrive each day and generally the last to leave. Uh, whilst the orchestras are rehearsing, uh, they also do sessions that are run by the tutor with a variety of guest speakers, uh, exploring the different roles and areas that exist in the industry looking at the many different types of jobs and tasks that uh, you might consider under the orchestral management umbrella. Uh, and many people that you, you do that particular program use it as a springboard into other jobs in the industry. Uh, participants from recent years are currently working at some organisations, including Opera Australia, the Melbourne Symphony, Music Aviva, Orchestra Victoria, and the Australian Chamber Orchestra, just to name drop a few. Uh, now, Miller, you attended National Music Camp as a participant of the sound production course. Uh, could you tell us a bit about what encouraged you to apply for this course and then maybe discuss some of the things that you learned whilst at camp? Yeah, sure. So um, I graduated school in 2018 and then as my type of gap year, I studied sound production at TAFE and just to disclaimer, you don't need to do this to be able to participate in the sound production course. Um, but so at TAFE, you obviously record bands and, and small gigs, but I've played cello all my life. So I was, my passions lied in classical music. And then I saw an ad for this national camp and sound production pop up on my Facebook. And I was like, oh, I need to sign up for this. And so luckily enough, I was able to be a part of it. If you have a strong passion for sound production and recording sound and actually having the opportunity to record a hundred piece orchestra, it's really an opportunity that I just couldn't miss. In the sound production course, we are normally the first ones that are there as well before the <laughs> musicians arrive to make sure that our mics are still standing all good. And then if the orchestral management team are setting up, then we need to watch that they don't bump any of the expensive equipment or how our leads are running. Um, when the orchestra is 
practicing their pieces and doing dress rehearsals we will record them just to see what it sounds like we have like a little studio under the stage it's very cool um so we're in our little sound cave and we have set up cameras as well so we can also see what's going on so it was really like our kind of bat cave for sound it was heaps of fun um we also did a lot of smaller side projects so we worked with words about music so that they can record their pieces um and our tutor of that year was Jakob and he was just so knowledgeable um he worked with the Adelaide Symphony and so he just had years of experience and he told us little snippets every day and gave us good lectures if we did something wrong but it was a very enriching experience oh great uh, now you mentioned you did some things with the words about music course. Uh, could you tell us about how the sound production course coexists with that, some of the other programs and the sort of interaction you had with participants that weren't doing your course? Yeah, sure. So with words about music, I don't really know what they needed to do, but they wrote a piece and they needed to record it um, so they were able to share it. And so we showed them how certain recording equipment um, functions so that A, they can record. And then how we used during the sound production um, course, we used a software called Reaper. Um, so we familiarized them with some of the basic functions of Reaper so that they could edit and kind of make a finished product of their piece. Great. Yeah. Now at the end of two weeks, how many minutes of music do you think you ended up recording? So I had to, I had to have a long think about this one. Um, probably finished product, probably about 13 hours of music. Because wow. there were there were two concerts, um, two major concerts and then smaller concerts in between. But draft music and all of that must have been more than at least 25 hours of music, which is really awesome. <laughs> I had to look back, yeah. Wow, that's that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Now, one of the orchestras that you would have been involved in recording would have been the Composition Ensemble, uh, which is a, a small orchestra or a sinfonietta consisting of the National Music Camp Tudor team. Uh, now, this ensemble rehearses and performs four brand new works written as part of each year's camp by the composition students. Uh, to Melody, mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us a bit about what happens from the point where someone's offered a position in the composition program mm -hmm. to the point where there's an orchestra on stage of um, the AYO tutors who are some of some of the best musicians in the country Incredible. Um, yeah. workshopping, workshopping their piece. Uh, do the so, composers write this entirely at camp? No, they do not. Um, that, that idea has been abandoned <laughs> just to eliminate the stress on the students. Um, so that the deal is that um, by the time you get to camp, you've finished all or most of the piece. Um, and uh, the point of doing that is to make sure that we have enough time to discuss it in sessions one-on-one -on -one, um, with the composition tutor. And to if there's anything that does need to be tweaked, before the first rehearsal at the beginning of the second week, then we have time to do that. Um, however, before camp starts, um, I believe it's new procedure for us to have online meetings um, to discuss the progress of the work. So we do get contacts um, and to check in with you to see how the work in progress is coming along. Great. Uh, now, whilst, whilst the composition students are at camp, uh, I know they do a lot of sort of hiding away and working on scores. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe I know it changes a bit each year, but mm -hmm. could you give us an idea of the sort of other activities that happened yeah. in the composition course when you were tutoring? Um, so one of the things that we loved doing was actually doing um, workshops with instrumentalists from sourcing throughout the camp. So mostly tutors, but if there are guests, musicians that um, are at the camp that certain year, like in 2020 was William Barton um, with his didgeridoo. He came and gave us a workshop for a couple of hours and it was incredible. Even I got something from it. <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah, workshopping with actual musicians and um, I find this is very helpful for students, especially with instruments like harp. Um, quite often coming in to this program, you'll be potentially writing for harp properly for the first time. So workshopping with, you know, whoever the harp tutor is, is incredibly valuable. Um, and we do that 
more intensely over the first week. Um, so we get up to that kind of um, work, but we also take advantage of Adelaide itself. Um, when uh, 2019 and 2020, we would do um, expeditions to the gallery just to try and absorb some extra musical sources from outside of the musical world um, to pick up on whatever was going on in Adelaide um, exhibition wise. That was really fun. Um, and we also do a lot of sessions where we talk about music, obviously, um, certain pieces that we're interested in, score reading, orchestral reading, very important, um, analysis, um, and let me think, there's always the, the famous cricket match that happens. <laughs> <laughs> the composers tried to get involved. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot that goes on. And we also try to give you enough time to actually get some composing done yourself um, if you need to spend a little bit more time on your piece. So we usually have uh, later morning starts, which is always nice. Oh, that's very <laughs> nice. It's a good reason to do the course. Yeah. <laughs> I might do it. <laughs> uh, we've now, we've just had a question come in on the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone's just asked uh, about what sort of, or what type of music uh, they'd be creating if they were involved in the program. Is there a like a, a stylistic requirement or is it fairly open? Or? It's incredibly open. And the answer to that is what kind of music are you creating? And that's what we want to hear. We don't want you to try and be somebody else. Um, it's absolutely 100%. What are you working on? What interests you? Um, and um, I believe it's important to try and get a, a good spread of diversity when it comes to composition applicants. Um, so we usually have quite a few different composers coming in that are working on different stuff with different ideas, different concepts, different interests. Great. Okay. Uh, now the fourth course we're talking about tonight, uh, Words About Music, uh, covers a variety of music journalistic areas. Philip, You've been tutoring the course now for a couple of years. Uh, what sort of things might uh, one, per, one end up doing as part of the WAM course? Well, in a way, you uh, articulate what goes on at camp for the audience for camp, which, which is the audience is the people at camp and the audience is people who come to the performances. Um, uh, it's for people who consume uh, AYO uh, material online as well. So it's it's really, uh, there's a lot of variety. First of all, you're writing all the program notes for the major public performances that take place. Um, you're contributing to the, the beautiful document that comes out right at the end of camp, which at the moment is a calendar called Music of Fever. It's got a very long history, that document, I know. In its current form, it's a calendar with lots and lots of fabulous editorial in it which the Words About Music cohort uh, creates. Um, and in a way, that's a kind of wonderful souvenir of the two weeks, a pictorial souvenir, an editorial souvenir. It contains usually lots of great interviews with participants at camp, with tutors. Uh, it can contain some very thoughtful pieces too about music, about performance practice, about a whole range of things. Um, I encourage the participants to, to blog as well because the wonderful AYO marketing team is very encouraging of the participants creating blogs that can be reflections on the on the repertoire that's being performed on a particular aspect of camp on uh, on perhaps on one of the conductors or on one of the soloists. Um, uh, there's opportunities to present performances from the stage as well. And, and given that every musician really is should be great at talking about what they do. I'm really encouraging uh, the participants in WAM to be able to uh, engagingly and coherently and uh, you know present a performance from the stage just for a couple of minutes. Uh, it it sounds simple, but but doing it well and doing it uh, in a way that you feel great also is 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 quite tricky and. Uh, it's great working with the young people on this. And in fact, I'm pretty sure I've hopefully uh, been responsible for making some people go from, I couldn't possibly do that to actually feeling pretty comfortable about it, I hope. 
and and it's wonderful when it works it really is um there's opportunities to create uh material for the ayo social media channels um and there's podcasting opportunities too which uh is one of the things that uh, that that Myla was alluding to before. So there's there's a great deal to be done, and and in some ways there's also an opportunity to do stuff spontaneously. Some things don't really happen until you're at camp, and somebody in the cohort gets an idea, and, and that's also a wonderful thing to behold. Excellent. Now, if someone loves say writing but they hate public speaking, can they still do the course? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're, <laughs> hating public speaking, uh, I'm, I'd like to think that there's there's room to move there. I'd like to think that we can get to a point where, um, and look, it, it is really, it, it's not a major part of what we do it in WAM, but I just think if you're going to communicate beautifully on the page and on the screen, it's also important that you at least start to think about how you communicate in person. If we are living in a world where portfolio careers are a reality, then I think it's a bit of a non-negotiable skill to be able to stand in front of a group of people and be articulate, even if it's only for a minute or so. Okay. Uh, now, camp has a few long held traditions. Uh, you mentioned that the WAM group work on uh, Musica Fever, which is a, a very clever play on words. Um, and a, a lovely departing memento uh, each year. Uh, Melanie touched on the cricket match just before, um, and she mentioned that the, the composition cohort tries to get involved. Philip, what are your expectations of the WAM participants and the cricket match? <laughs> Look, I would like to think they would take part. I would like to think they would take part enthusiastically, but don't forget, it is the responsibility of the WAM cohort to also report on the cricket match uh, accurately and with enthusiasm. Okay, well, given that the students are yet to win a game, they could perhaps do that, do that in advance. Talk about <laughs> Look, the there's there's colour and movement on the night that just needs to be, you know, you, you really have to be there. You know that, Warren. <laughs> Indeed. Hey, um, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe touch on your connection with AYO in the past few years? Sure thing, Nathan. Uh, thanks for, for having us here. I'm looking forward to tonight. Um, I've been in the performing arts uh, all of my life, um, often working for the ABC or for universities or for um, different European broadcast um, groups like, say, the BBC or recently with the Berlin Phil Digital Concert Hall. Um, I've recorded the AYO concerts uh, for a number of years um, and on occasions I've been uh, I've been involved in the tutoring side and this year for instance I was a tutor at the Melbourne camp I'm not sure what the official title of the Melbourne camp was Nathan maybe you could help me <laughs> but, uh, uh, the auto music camp the one we had <laughs> okay good thank you and um, so that this year I was, I was tutoring in sound production and we had some great students. Uh, I figure we'll start with the space and setup of the actual audition. So first up, uh, we've had some questions about how do you choose a good room to actually do your recording in. Hey, do you want to touch on this a little bit and talk about what's good, what isn't, what you can do? Sure. Um, look, they, they, they say very often for sound recording, the, the, the most important instrument is the room. Now, if we, if you're at uni or at school or somewhere like that, and there's a big uh, performance venue or rehearsal venue, try and use that for your audition if you can. Now, um, if you can't, and a lot of us can't always do that, um, we, we need to find somewhere at home. Um, sometimes a, a sort of an open space within the home is, is a good thing to use. Very often a way of finding that is to take your instrument and to go into that space and play and see how comfortable you feel. You know that if you play in a really beautiful room, it feels nice to play, and that's that's going to help you if you're if you're recording that sound. That's what you want. So you want something that's fairly generous if you can, but not too generous. If you go into your bathroom, that you may you may feel really good, but that may not actually 
<laughs> that may not as work as you you want. So you're looking for something that's uh, got some space and air so that your sound can can travel in the air um, rather than being in a in a, a tightly spaced room with a lot of carpet and and that sort of thing. Great. Um Maybe Fiona, you've probably done a couple of recorded auditions. What's your experience with this? What sort of places have you ended up uh, going with? I think Haig was spot on with what he said. So I think definitely finding a space with good, um, good acoustics is very important. So most ideally um, a space that is not too echoey, like the bathroom <laughs> and not too dry. So I have like a life hack for this actually. <laughs> if it's too yeah. echoey, um, what my mum told me was I can put some yoga mats around the recording space at home um, to make it less uh, echoey so that the yoga mat soaks up the sound. You can do that with like stuffed animals as well. Just, yeah, any material or fabric that soaks up sound would be good. Um, something else is, uh, so as Haig said, if you have um, access to a big performance space as well, like, at a university, definitely use that opportunity for your audition tape because it really does help. Um, so for example, with my experience last year back at um, the Queensland Conservatorium, if you're in Brisbane, um, you would wanna try to book the recital hall for the recordings. Um, I would always have to book really early on as well because they usually get booked out near audition times, especially for AYO auditions. Uh, so yeah, definitely try to book as early as you can. And uh, if you're stuck at home as well, I think finding a space is very important um, that you like, uh, a space that you like. So I think it's like a trial and error thing. You want to spend some time recording in different spaces at home and uh, adjusting where your microphone is or where your phone is is also really important it actually changes a lot um of your sound uh depending on where you adjust your microphone as well you need to have as much of your instrument and yourself in the shot as possible so ideally if you could get your whole body head to toe in that'd be great but if not at the very least we'll need to see all of the instrument and wherever your hands are moving and playing or your mouth um, just so that we can kind of replicate some of the elements of an in-person audition. Um, you'll also need to remain in the shot the entire time, um, just so we know it hasn't been edited, basically. Um, so try not to wander off, uh, off the, the actual recording. Um, you'll need to record it in landscape mode, uh, just because consistency for assessing them and we get a better, I guess, sense of your movement in the space. Um, yeah, essentially what we wanted you to do is try and emulate as much as possible um, the in-person experience. Um, so things that, that uh, get us closer to that effect are always good. It looks like we had a question um, relating to this positioning, talking about um, distancing with the microphone from you, um, considering where you are in the space and positioning the, the camera further away, but also the microphone. Maybe, Haig, if you want to just do a, a really quick answer that one before we jump into recording and devices in a bit more depth? Uh, yeah, sure. The, for some instruments, it, it may not be ideal to have the the audio source and the video source in exactly the same place. That 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 is a fact of life. And um, if you're playing something, uh, for instance, such as a bass drum, you may want to consider that the audio is the is probably the important part of that. And you'll need to move a little bit further away to appreciate all the dynamics and, and the sound that the bass drum is giving. Um, maybe also trombone, maybe double bass. Uh, instruments like this, um, it doesn't hurt to be just that little bit further back so that we can actually see everything and you don't want to be overloading the mics or, or whatever's going on. So just just going back briefly, but very, very quickly on just, just positioning, it's things like make sure you clean the lens on your camera or whatever you've got, you know, just make sure those things are clean. Make sure you've got some good light. So at the moment, you can see the three of us here. We're quite visible. That's a really good thing to do. If I have a bright light right behind me, if I've got the sun coming through the window or something like that, it just it's just not quite a, as pleasant an experience for the person watching. So um, if you're framing yourself up, just make sure that um, 
you know, it, it looks presentable enough. Um, with with uh, Fiona sitting, if she was to pick up her violin and start playing, we, we'd all be able to see it and she might have to move back a bit. So we, we see, you know, the finger and the bows and she's quite right. But get yourself in frame so that every, everything's there um, and have a look at what you've done afterwards and maybe get, get, get a relative to have a look at it who's going to be quite, quite honest with you and let them let them tell you what they you know what they think don't don't be afraid of a bit of constructive criticism i thought we could talk a little bit about the actual devices and recordings um what you can use um how to set them up what people might have access to um we do have a lot of questions about this so i'll try and categorize them into groups but i guess a question to to both of you Hague and fiona what devices would you find useful or in Fiona's case have you actually used to uh, do auditions before? So I actually have my microphone here so this is the one that I use it's called the Rode NT-USB Mini and I got it from this place called like DJ City in Brisbane or something <laughs> yeah but you can get it online definitely um I so this basically just plugs into my computer and I can record um through Zoom or through like photo booth or anything just take in mind um if you're a macbook user and you're recording on photo booth as well that photo booth actually flips the camera um so you'll have to edit the f uh, video later on and flip it back again to the normal um way yeah um i use this microphone as well because i find that a lot of more of my dynamics and vibrato um comes out a lot more uh than when I don't use the microphone. But um, everyone is different. You don't have to use it. Uh, this is just my recommendation, yeah. Great. Hey, do you have any good go-to devices? Obviously we have some easy ones that everyone has access to and we can talk more about phones in a second, but if there are any other suggestions? Yeah, look, that's great. And Fiona's done some good homework there and it's not a bad idea to use a dedicated microphone and uh, um just uh, i'm not plugging dj city i'm just saying that is a national chain so and they do have online so there's a number of ways that you can source things like that and um uh if fiona's a concert master i think you know it's probably not a bad recommendation to <laughs> to consider something like that um yeah the simplicity of doing these things is always is always a really good thing the the traps sometimes are unfortunately that each device might have um, individual settings for the sound. Do you want me to talk about that briefly, Nathan? Is this yeah, I guess we, we have a lot of questions about these kind of devices, particularly phones. Um, so maybe if you touch on some of the limitations there and um, some of the things you have to, to manage. We, we yeah. Recordings on phones are perfectly acceptable, but yeah, Haig might explain a bit yeah. more how to use it. Yeah. The, the, I mean, but bearing in mind that sometimes these devices are, are not necessarily made to to record music on necessarily, so that they'll have a they'll have a number of things in them which make things like speech all leveled out. So, uh, for instance, if you're recording a conversation between friends and you're having a laugh and people people tell a joke and and suddenly the sounds a whole lot louder, uh, there are things that are within a lot of audio devices that, that take those really loud things and just bring them down a bit. And the things that are very, very soft, they'll bring them up there. So everything's in this nice sort of thing where you can you can listen to it in your car as you're driving along and doesn't matter if there's any road noise everything's the same but you'll miss out on the dynamics and it also means that when things are very quiet you might end up getting a lot of very hissy sort of sound that's going on so as Fiona said she's got a device which helps her with her uh, dynamics it allows those things to come in so there's a thing called auto gain control or auto leveling in your audio you probably want to get into your device, try to find all the settings, download the manual if need be for your device, um, have a look at that and make sure that those settings are defeated or turned off. Um, and you also want to think about the distance are from the microphone because, uh, you know, if you're too close, you're going to get get an overloaded, distorted sound. It's not going to be very pleasant. If you're too far away, you might end up hearing a lot more of your, of, say, I mean, I'm in a sort of a bedroom kind of thing here and I'm just going to hear a lot of the walls there. So 
just experiment a little to try and find an ideal distance uh, with with what you've got. Have your settings uh, on your device such that you've, you're recording at a higher bit rate rather than a lower bit rate. So it might have something like 128 kbps MP3 or something like that, and you might try it and mightn't be quite so nice or they might have a higher figure like 320 or 256 and that might be that might give you a better result yeah um, great yeah so keep keeping that stuff in mind will, will help you get the best out of um a standalone device like that um it, it is acceptable if you wanted to record the video and audio on a different device and then combine them, but it has to be um, unedited still. So um, the, the audio and visuals, I mean, um, editing beyond uh, combining them is not allowed. Another question, uh, I guess, about our requirements that we got was whether the excerpts and the own choice need to be recorded on the same day and more sort of that, whether they need to be recorded separately and combining. So to, to clarify that, we need, uh, for most uh, instrumental auditions, we need two separate full videos. Um, one of them contains uh, the excerpts, um, which essentially has you doing a little bit of speaking at the start and then playing through all your excerpts uh, in the order that they are listed in the, um, the excerpt pack and then ending the recording. And that's one video all together in one take. And then there is another video, which is the same. You say a short thing and then you play your own choice piece and then end that video all in one take. Um, those two don't necessarily have to be recorded on the same day, as long as the video itself is recorded all at the same time. So you, you couldn't do one of your excerpts on one day and one of them on another day and combine it together. Uh, it has to be all in one take, but yeah, you don't have to have the same day necessarily for both of the, um, both of the auditions. We talked a little bit already about um, combining different audio um, and video together. Um, did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Haig, hey, maybe uh, suggestions of a, a program that you could use to do that if you hadn't before? Sure, look, there are a lot of, um... A lot of things that are usually freely available. If you're in the Mac world, you can use things like iMovie, um, so or or other other free other free applications on on PC that are either free or, or trialware or things like that. But the idea is that you get your audio file and you get your video file. The video file will have audio on it as well. So you want to join the two, play them together, make sure it's all in sync, and then before you. Uh, make that rendered into one file make sure you mute the the audio that's in the the video recorded file um, and have a look at your levels make sure you're not you're not peaking and going to the red and distorting and that sort of thing so any any kind of um, free software that's around is usually totally adequate for doing that sort of thing and you can trim the ends and then render it and then you can give it a good name and it can be ready for ready for upload yeah, and um, all, the, all the edits that Hayes describing there are, um, I guess, the tidying side of stuff. We're clipping the ends and combining it. Um, just to clarify that you still shouldn't be changing the audio, adding reverb, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just add one quick thing there, Nathan, is that is that it's it's tempting to um, d digital allows us to fix a lot of things and to change a lot of things, and while it might be tempting to to do that, um, the 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 trouble is with doing that is that if you if you turn up and play live, and you're not as good as what your tape was, uh, uh, people people put a question mark over what you've done, and that question mark can follow you around for a little bit too long in life, and it, it's best to just be fair about everything that you do. 